Is there anyone in the audience who has a question? There's a question over here. Hi. Oh, Hello. Question here. Uh, Professor Hinton, I've got a um, question. Just after watching your slides on the, uh, on the language of thought, uh, are you suggesting that you'd be able to uh, have machine or algorithms that are able to understand, or could you train these nets to understand human emotion or simulate emotions similar to those that human beings uh, simulate in their brains? I don't see why not. I don't see anything special about emotion in that sense. We can already get computers that are pretty good at reading the emotional expressions of faces. Um, but most people say, but a computer couldn't have an emotion. And I think that's just a misunderstanding of how natural language works. You could have a state of activity inside this big neural net in the computer, such that if the computer wasn't exercising self-control, it would get out there and punch you. And that would be a cross-computer. And it would be a genuinely cross-computer. <laughs> We've got another uh, question. I was wondering, how do you see the, uh, the commercialization of deep learning playing out? So, is the commercialization. There commercialization. So, I see it as a thoroughly good thing. OK. But I mean, uh, is it going to be an API that you would basically download and train for your specific task? Or, or is it just going to be something that big companies like Google, Flickr, et cetera, are going to train for their specific tasks? Um. I think it's actually quite tricky for me to comment on that at present. OK. Sorry. I understand. <laughs> Thank you for your question. There was a question over here. I wonder, it could, is it possible to pass the microphone over? Yes, please shout, yes. Yeah, I do have a point of view. I mean, I'm not very confident in it, but my point of view is we'll get a symbiosis. I mean, there was a, I don't know biology very well, but there was a point a long time ago when cells got other cells inside them, mitochondria or something, and that made things go better. And I think you might think of it in evolutionary terms like that, that up to now we've just been biological cells, but now you're gonna get a symbiosis of a person and an intelligent computer, and that's gonna be a far more powerful thing. And I'm hoping that that's the route it goes, rather than computers replacing people. But that, that assumes the relationship between electronics and biology. Because the symbiotic relationship, one is a machine that's been created, and the other is a, a living human being. Yeah, but remember, the machine can learn. So as long as you've got adaptive devices, um, your assistant can sort of adapt to you, and you can adapt to your assistant. So I agree there's an a question about how they communicate. And I'm sure there'll be all sorts of fancy technologies for getting things to activate your brain cells without um, having to put electrodes in. Um, no, the fact is, nobody has a clue about what's going to happen. <laughs> Any question over here? Yeah, just a quick, I have like 100 questions, but I'll only ask just one. Um, it's about accountability. So, you know, I have kids, and sometimes they have control of the parents, but not accountability if they break something. That would fall on my shoulders. How do you view as we get more sophisticated, multi-layer networks? You can't really debug them. In fact, you can. But who's accountable? Yeah. Um, For example, a kill decision on a drone. Yeah. I. I haven't really thought very hard about that problem, and there are, I know there are other people who've thought much harder about that problem, and so I don't really have anything useful to say. I think we have time maybe for one more question. You mentioned that uh, in order for the networks to get better and better, they need more and more neurons, millions, billions, trillions. And you also said that uh, if Moore's law continues to apply, we're going to have the ability to do that. But my question is whether you really think Moore's law is going to continue to apply, or are we going to run into quantum effects at some point that are going to create a bit of a barrier to moving to the, to the next level? Yeah, the thing about Moore's law is it's very like evolution itself, that you have a narrow view of, I mean, maybe 15 years ago, the view of Moore's law would be computers get twice as fast every two years. And it's the same sort of VLSI, but it's shrinking and getting faster, 
And that's how Moore's law is going to be achieved. And then all of a sudden, we reach a bottleneck there. And so it just kind of squirts sideways. And now we have more cores. And we get twice as many cores every two years. Um, then something else will happen. And so the, the set of things that can be developed to make Moore's law keep holding is a kind of open-ended set. It's not like you're playing a game where there's limited rules and so on. We are, of course, all governed by physics, but we're a long way from sort of particles here. And there's lots and lots of different things to be exploited. And what seems to happen historically, and I think will keep happening for a while, is that we'll just find different directions to improve in. Maybe it'll all suddenly go genuinely 3D, and that'll be a huge win. Um, so I actually think Moore's law is going to hold for longer than most people think it's going to hold. Okay. And I think another 10 years is perfectly thank you. reasonable. An optimistic view, and good. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank you for your questions. I want to thank Jeffrey for that um, very stimulating presentation. And you'll be around if people want to chat with you informally uh, afterwards. Yeah, and I'd like to thank Nora for joining us to host. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey.